So what I was saying, it's my third trip in, in Africa in three months. Uh, I've been in Mali, I've been in Morocco, I've been to Egypt at the Aswan Forum. So I think it's important here today we met uh, a number of African leaders, uh, the Mauritius, Madagascar. Uh, it's important for Canada to be at the African Union Summit. Uh, we talk about climate change, we thought about our, foreign, our, our feminist foreign policy. Uh, talk about things that matter, multilateralism, uh, bringing that positive voice that Canada can bring to the world as a country which is part of G7, G20, NATO, the Commonwealth, La Francophonie. So uh, a lot of good discussion. How can we bring the voice of Africa to the UN Security Council? I also want to provide you an update. I spoke yesterday to the group CEO of All in America, Mr. Cruz. Uh, we had a discussion of about 40 minutes. I wanted to make sure that all in America is doing everything on the Diamond Princess, which is in a port in Japan. We have 255 Canadians, uh, which are currently in quarantine. We have seven Canadians who have tested positive for the coronavirus. And I wanted to make sure that we were all linked up, uh, making sure that we're there for the families, for the people who are there. And uh, before I came to see you, I learned that uh, uh, the plane which is going to repatriate, the second Canadian plane has just left Trenton uh, on its way, uh, obviously, to Asia. As we said, we would bring back Canadians. Uh, the plane would be leaving on the 10th of February, bringing back uh, the last group of Canadians in Iran who wants to be repatriated on the 11th. So happy to take your question, obviously, in French or in English. Well, um, you know, every leader that you speak to has a positive inclination towards Canada. I think they see in Canada that, that constructive voice, what I call the transatlantic voice. Uh, and, and they want to make sure that the voice of Africa is represented and, and they think that Canada embodies a lot of the, uh, whether we talk about governance, whether we talk about uh, youth, our, our feminist foreign policy. You know, Africa is going to be uh, where half of the world population will be in 2050, more than 5 billion people. So the youth of the world is here in Africa and, and the voice of Canada is inspiring. So what we've heard from leaders is that uh, certainly they'd welcome Canada on the Security Council and obviously uh, we have been seeking their support, but my inclination or what I saw from them was this uh, inclination to say, yes, Canada can be the voice of Africa on the Security Council and, and embody some of the same principles, the same values about climate change, multilateralism, economic security that we need, you know, here in Africa. So far, I must say what I've heard from African leaders is that they certainly welcome Canada on the Security Council. I think. It, it embodies the type of leadership they'd like to see more in the world. Yeah. So uh, what I was saying is that what I hear from African leaders is that um, why Canada is because Canada would be uh, that voice that they want, a progressive country, a transatlantic country, which, which embodies some of the same values around values, principle, governance. Uh, uh, they want a country which, which understand as well uh, some of the big challenges and can speak about it. And, they certainly want to see a country, the transatlantic country that I say, which they'd like to see on the Security Council because Canada embodies that with a positive leadership by the Prime Minister and, and what really Canadians are around the world. That's, that's what the Africans want, but yeah. why do the Canadians want it? Oh, which, why is it, which so, is it for Canada? Sorry. Okay. So, no, no, I apologize. So, um, well, I think, you know, the UN Security Council is, is the biggest table you can have around the world. You know, that's where Canada made a difference. If you go back in history, that's where we had, for example, the Landmine Treaty, where Canada can bring things to the table because uh, there's a rotating presidency for those watching us at home. So when you have the presidency for two weeks, uh, it allows you to bring things uh, to the Security Council. And I think uh, it also... Uh, favor a lot of discussion with the permanent members, whether it's China, Russia, uh, the United States, uh, the United Kingdom, or France. So uh, it, it makes you certainly at the big table where you can bring issues uh, that matters to the world and matters not only to African, but I would say to liberal democracies in the world. Well, I think whenever you speak to people, you, you bring something forward. You know, I'm, I'm one who believes fundamentally the dialogue is the only way to bring uh, things closer, whether you talk about China with respect to the two Michaels, and, and I've been very clear that whilst we're dealing with the coronavirus with, with the Chinese authority, that the foremost priority is to bring the Michaels back home. Uh, every time I have a chance to talk to my Chinese counterpart, every time there's a dialogue, obviously um, we bring uh, that issue, and, and I think um, the more you talk, the more you can certainly try to build a bridge that is needed in order to strengthen uh, or to restore relationship. 
Uh, when it comes to Iran, you know, I, I judge them by their actions, step by step. That's what I've said to the Iranian. Obviously, uh, one of the issues we have is the black boxes. You may have seen, I've, I've uh, been clear to the Iranian. Now it's more than 30 days since the crash. There comes a time where you need to come to terms and say, you know what? Um, I think they've understood from the different uh, civil aviation authority in the world that the type of equipment and expertise you need to read the black box cannot be brought to Iran. So the solution in front of all of us, uh, whether it's the world community or the international response and coordination group, is to send these black boxes without delay to Paris, which has all the equipment. Uh, and I've said the, the, the best antidote to conspiracy is transparency. And I've said that to my Iranian counterpart, and I will restate that message when I meet him, uh, obviously, next. You'd be, you'd, you'd be surprised. Okay. You'd be surprised, I think. Uh, obviously, it's, it's a confidential vote, but I would say uh, just look at what happened. I met my Indian counterpart at the G20, and I think 20 days after, he came on a bilateral visit to Canada. And I must say, since then, we had very good contact. I think India understand that... Uh, uh, it'd be good for us to work together on the United uh, Nations Security Council that that uh, there's a number of issues which we would like to progress together and that we have been talking already what could we bring to the United States Security Council, uh, United Nations uh, Security Council. So obviously it's for them to make a choice, but I think that they understand what Canada can bring to the table. Good. Well, um, before I left Canada, I made sure that two thirds of our Canadians were well, you know, were in Trenton and, and well taken care of. I made the same thing. I just looked before I came to see you with the CEO of the logistics company. You know me by now, so I know exactly where the plane is. Uh, the second plane to bring the Canadians back home. And before I left yesterday, I spoke to the CEO of All in America to make sure that we would provide all the necessary facilities uh, to the people who are on the ship in, in, in Japan. So, you know, in my job, you have to make sure that we provide all the consular assistance, deal with the emergency, but also think about the long term. So it's managing both the, the long term strategic interest of Canada while at the same time answering to uh, obviously whatever crisis is present. And I think uh, we're doing uh, both at the same time. And, and I think that's what Canadians would expect from me. We're not going to investigate the oh, details. Of the let me be, I'll be very clear with you. When I spoke last to my Iranian counterpart, there's always three things on the table. When we started, it was about consular assistance. There was five things always on the agenda. The first was obviously when we started consular assistance. Uh, the second thing was the repatriation of remains. Uh, these two obviously are not completed. Uh, the third thing was obviously the black box, since they want obviously to, to read the black box in accordance with Annex 13. The second thing is, uh, the fourth thing I would say, is the criminal investigation because we said we want to bring closure, justice, transparency, the families, the world have a lot of questions about who has committed that crime and, and we want to understand who in the chain of command would be responsible. But the fifth and very important uh, point we had with the families was compensation, both the statutory compensation from the airlines, and I spoke to the CEO of Ukrainian Airlines, but also the state compensation that will be due by Iran. And in my last discussion with the Iranian foreign minister, uh, they have appointed someone specifically to start the negotiation with the International Coordination and Response Group. Uh, we want compensation to go to the family as quickly as possible. And that's something that I will bring again in our next meeting. Well, I think whenever you speak to people, you, you bring something forward. You know, I'm, I'm one who believes fundamentally the dialogue is the only way to bring uh, things closer, whether you talk about China with respect to the two Michaels, and, and I've been very clear that whilst we're dealing with the coronavirus with, with the Chinese authority, that the foremost priority is to bring the Michaels back home. Uh, every time I have a chance to talk to my Chinese counterpart, every time there's a dialogue, obviously um, we bring uh, that issue, and, and I think um, the more you talk, the more you can certainly try to build a bridge that is needed in order to strengthen uh, or to restore relationship. Uh, when it comes to Iran, you know, I, I judge them by their actions step by step. That's what I've said to the Iranian. Obviously, uh, one of the issues we have is the black boxes. You may have seen, I've, I've uh, been clear to the Iranian. Now it's more than 30 days since the crash. There comes a time where you need to come to terms and say, you know what, um, I think they've understood from the different uh, civil aviation authority in the world that the type of equipment and expertise you need to read the black box cannot be brought to Iran. So the solution in front of all of us, 
uh, whether it's the world community or the international response and coordination group, is to send these black boxes without delay to Paris, which has all the equipment. Uh, and I've said the, the, the best antidote to conspiracy is transparency. And I've said that to my Iranian counterpart, and I will restate that message when I meet him, uh, obviously, next. Uh, it's going to be a pretty full plane. Uh, so I don't have the exact number bear with me because the manifest is being finalized as we speak. So I don't have the count, but it's certainly going to be uh, it's going to be a full plane.